This is the seventh in a series of lectures on an introduction to exterior differential systems. In this lecture, we want to try to figure out what to do about the problem we ran into in the last lecture, which was that um, we had an exterior differential system to which we tried to apply the cartan kahler theorem, but the cartan kahler theorem refused to tell us what happens. The cartan kahler theorem has a predicted dimension against which we compare an actual dimension of integral elements, and if they agree, then it predicts the existence, it proves the existence of integral manifolds. But if they don't agree, it doesn't say what to do. So we want to figure out what, to, what should we do. What do we do next when the predicted dimension from Cartan Keller doesn't match the actual dimension of integral elements? So uh, let's go back to our example. In our example, we found that every integral element was parameterized by some kind of expression like this. We don't really need to remember in great detail what the example looked like. We remember that there was an exterior differential system and at some point we wrote down that every integral element could be expressed like this. It could be expressed by making various of these gammas be multiples of these omegas and alpha. So uh, they look like this. In terms of the abstract theory of exterior differential systems and tableau, remember we talked about tableau having some expression of sort of thetas, omegas, and pi's, and these uh, could be said to be that the various pi's uh, on the left-hand side, those expressions in gammas are really uh, are really polars. They're really pi's, and what we found is that they are multiples of the omegas. In this case, omega one, omega two, and we could consider alpha to be another omega uh, very an omega one form for this for this sort of exterior differential system. In terms of the theory of tableau, we have three uh, omegas, and we have these three pi's, these three polars. And what we find is that the polars are certain expressions. In the, in the various omegas uh, that are on the integral elements. So we've written down an equation that describes the integral elements. What can we do with that, though? What we, what we can do is to use this as a new exterior differential system because we can construct a new manifold which has the, uh, the AIJs as new variables. After all, they could take on any values whatsoever, and that would give us an integral element for the original exterior differential system. We're going to construct a new manifold, which takes the manifold of the original exterior differential system, adds onto it new variables to make a, a bigger dimensional manifold, and then we could throw, in, throw these equations in as equations on of our ex new exterior differential system. So it means that in the process of calculating the integral elements of the old exterior differential system, we automatically write down, without even trying, equations that can be used as the new exterior differential system. We take the old exterior differential system we had and we throw in these new equations into it with new variables. Uh, when you uh, check the new exterior differential system, its new tableau, you can calculate out the tableau, which I won't do. Again, it's done in detail in the lecture notes. To, to throw those new equations in, you get a new tableau. You compute out the, um, the uh, torsion of that tableau, and you find it has torsion. And so this means that we'd have to have some special equation satisfied in order that we could have uh, any, uh, any integral manifolds. So once again, we had an exterior differential system, which we called I. And we checked last time that Cartan Kaler failed on that system. We wrote down an equation, which we've written right here, for the integral elements. Use the, that equation as, as part of a new exterior differential system on a new manifold. This equation, together with the ones we already had from the previous uh, exterior differential system, but with these AIJ as new variables on a new manifold. Now we've uh, we've checked the that new exterior differential system. We write out a tableau for it, which I haven't done, but which you can do. You can compute out the tableau, and you'll find the torsion. When you check the torsion, you'll find it exactly that it gives you this determinant of the AIJ matrix must be exactly the K. In other words, it tells us that the integral elements you're allowed to use are exactly the ones for which the shape operator that they're imposing on your surface fits the Gauss curvature of the given surface S. So again, we're, we're, we're looking at trying to bend a, a surface S without stretching. And we're finding that if you want to bend it without stretching, 
you have to have the new shape operator in the immersed image of the surface have Gauss curvature exactly matching the Gauss curvature of the given surface in the original expression for that surface. So in other words, that the Gauss curvature is invariant under bending without stretching. It's invariant under isometric immersion. So what we've discovered is the, is the theorem of Gauss that the um, Gauss curvature is invariant under any isometric immersion of a surface. And what we've discovered in a, in a, in a sort of a, uh, an automatic manner, we've written down an exterior differential system which describes isometric immersions, and automatically we, we failed to have integral manifolds for a simple reason, that we hadn't imposed this Gauss equation. Um, now that we've, uh, we've gone to the new exterior differential system by adding the AIJs as new variables, we've automatically found that the torsion forces this Gauss equation. So the torsion of the exterior differential system comes along and forces us to impose the Gauss equation. This is very satisfying because it tells us that exterior differential systems are somehow automatically noticing geometric conditions, which in this case are fairly high order geometric conditions, that will ensure that there are solutions, there are integral manifolds. Now once we take that into account, we realize that torsion equation reduces us from having three AIJ variables to really having only two, because the three variables have to satisfy that one equation, that torsion equation there. That has to vanish. So the determinant of the AIJs has to equal capital K, the Gauss curvature. Um, that Gauss equation then, it reduces us from having three different AIJs to having only two effectively. Um, because one of them you can solve for using the Gauss equation in terms of the other two. And uh, that means that as long as the AIJs don't all vanish, we can use that equation to solve for them, uh, for, for one of them in terms of the other two. And as long as we can do that, then, then there's really only two independent ones. In other words, there's only a two-dimensional space of integral elements. And that's why we were getting the wrong answer in our previous calculation. When we worked with the with the the uh, cartan kaler theorem before, we weren't imposing this Gauss equation. And because we didn't impose it, we had too many integral elements. This is a, a, a nice phenomenon that we encounter in exterior differential systems. Automatically, the, uh, the correct geometric conditions are enforced by the cartan kaler theorem by applying it. If it fails, it's because you haven't done something you were supposed to do, that there's some missing part of the geometry that you need to impose. And in this case, it's the Gauss equation. So well, to kill the torsion, what do you do? We can't work on everywhere. We can only work on the submanifold of those choices of AIJ variables for which the torsion is zero. In other words, for which the Gauss equation is satisfied. And as I said, that, that will allow us only two independent A's. And that means we get S1 plus 2, S2 is 2 plus 0, a two-dimensional space of integral elements at each point, and it does give us um, exactly what we wanted. We have uh, the, uh, the cartan kaler theorem succeeds now and predicts that uh, that there is there are these local isometric immersions, and not only that, it predicts that they they exist with every choice of these AIJs satisfying the Gauss equation. So you can bend the surface arbitrarily in such a way that you preserve its Gauss curvatures. You can pick the AIJs at a point as long as they have the right determinant, and then you can bend as you like. So you could take a little piece of a sphere, for example, which has Gauss curvature some so Gauss curvature, let's say one, and then you could uh, take any matrix AIJ with that determinant one, and you could make that be the, the shape operator of some isometric immersion of a piece of the sphere. So it gives us the ability to bend the surface in lots of, lots of ways. It shows there's a lot of flexibility. Not only that, it does have S1 equals two as the last non-zero character. So it says that in fact, isometric immersions depend on two functions of one variable, at least locally. So there is a lot of freedom. There's an infinite dimensional family of isometric immersions of any surface, at least locally. And again, this only works for real analytic surfaces, this proof. But it does tell us that the surfaces are all very flexible and that you really don't notice any distinction between any particular class of surfaces. There's no rigid surface, at least locally. This is again a local result. So it only tells us that little tiny pieces of the surface can be flexed in, in, in these nice ways. They can be bent without stretching. But it doesn't tell us what happens globally. 
So the general theory, though, leaving service theory behind, in general, if an exterior differential system fails the Cartan-Kaler test, the, the, the test of the Cartan-Kaler theorem, if it predicts the wrong dimension of integral elements, not equal to the, to the correct dimension, then, or not, not, not given by a submanifold of the correct dimension, then you should parameterize the integral elements as you did be above, that the various polars in the tableau are some multiples of the various omegas in the tableau. So going back to the theory of tableau, we had these polars pi. Each pi is going to be some multiple of omegas in such a way as to create an integral element. You parameterize the integral elements. And if you're lucky, they form a submanifold uh, of, of some dimension. Um, but since they failed cartan kaler they don't form a submanifold of the correct, of the predicted dimension. There are too few of them. There aren't as many as there should be somehow. So they must be subject to some condition, some constraint that isn't appearing right away in our exterior differential system. On the space of those integral elements, that is to say on the collection of choices of all the p's, uh, the choices of p's that create an integral element in that expression pi is p omega, on that space of integral elements you write a new exterior differential system, i prime, it's the prolongation, and it simply consists of the old exterior differential system i together with the new equation that each pi should be a suitable p omega, um, creating an integral element, and then the uh, the exterior derivatives of that. So it's generated by pi minus p omega, and that's the prolonged system. So it has uh, the, uh, the, the 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 beautiful feature that we can in effect think of it as just differentiating the original system. What we've done is to take the original system, but to include more information that the integral elements of the system can't be uh, uh, um, uh, anything. They have to be the, the ones that satisfy that pi is p omega equation. And that's in effect a kind of differentiating. We're including the information about what the integral elements are and throwing that into the exterior differential system. There are theorems which we won't get into and which are not really discussed even in the lecture notes because they're a bit complicated that say uh, as a general theory of this prolongation process, pi is p omega, including that, throwing into the ideal, and so on, that under mild hypotheses, which are very technical, which we don't want to discuss, uh, there are some theorems that say under mild hypotheses that prolong leads to involution. Not just necessarily one step, though. So there are simple examples where you prolong and prolong and prolong and prolong, and at every step, cartan keller doesn't work until eventually it does. Uh, the, the theorems say that under mild hypotheses, if you prolong enough times, eventually you get involution. And those theorems are, as I say, very technical and really beyond what we want to discuss here. But it does give us then a sense that cartan kaler is something of a final word in the, in the uh, problem of existence of integral manifolds. It, uh, as long as you can figure out how to do the calculations to find the characters, which may be impossible, but in, in, in many circumstances you can actually compute characters. You can write out a tableau, compute characters, calculate the integral elements, and check. And if it doesn't work, you can prolong. You can write pi equals p omega, throw that into the system, and keep going. And eventually you get some kind of answer as to whether or not there are any integral manifolds. Intuitively, you expect the failure of cartan kaler to be because there's some additional condition on, on the integral elements that's not included in the system. So if you throw in pi equals p omega, that includes that, uh, that in the system. Just as we found in our example, it, we included the, the Gauss equation into the system and we kept going. So by doing this, what we're doing in effect is to add in additional constraints on integral, integral elements and eventually we should hit uh, that there are no more additional constraints and so we would expect eventually we get involution. And that means that the cartan kaler theorem gives us a recipe to find all of the geometric constraints arising on these integral manifolds some of which will be constraints we wouldn't expect to find, we wouldn't guess ahead of time. They'll sh it'll show up these magic constraints that are required, and once it's finished and says there are no more such constraints, it gives you involution, then you have a good idea of what at least are the local constraints on the existence of integral manifolds, and you have a hope that maybe you could prove a theorem outside of the real analytic category, because now you have an intuitive understanding of what the problems are that could, be, that could arise in trying to construct integral manifolds. So uh, putting it all together, we can check 
if any analytic system of differential equations has local solutions, uh, roughly speaking, under mild hypotheses. Um, and we can do it using only linear algebra because we're, all we're really doing is writing out these tableau and then checking these characters, which is just manipulating these rows and columns using some linear algebra. So in some sense, you could say that you're checking whether a system of differential equations has local solutions using only linear algebra. And if it fails to, to work, then you throw in this prolongation equation and you keep going. Uh, pi is p omega and so on. And you keep going and going until eventually you get... Uh, a, a, an answer. The system tells you that there are integral manifolds or torsion arises that prevents them and there aren't. Okay, so next time we'll talk about the theory of Cartan's test and uh, try to explain how uh, Cartan's test actually works.